<clears throat> Good morning, family. I am Stephanie Wade. I am Habasia. I'm coming to you this morning in Galveston, Texas, USA, just to let you know that I'm doing just fine here, doing this social distancing. I wish I was in the motherland, but no can happen at this moment in time. I'm trying to find a good spot where the light will shine right on me. <coughs> There's no set rule to where you're supposed to be in this game of video recording. You think the light's supposed to be in the back of you, then the next thing you know, it's shining right on your little head. But anyways, I hope you all are feeling fine. You don't have anything big to complain about. Hope you're getting enough of the right things to eat. I hope so. I pray so. Excuse me for moving around so much. But hopefully everything is good with you guys. Hope that you've been learning new things, picking up new hobbies, reading new books, and watching new things even on social media something positive i know it's been so much negative stuff out here that we have no control over but that's just the way it is sometimes if you hear any noises please ignore it it's my neighbor's workers as usual making noise every time i try to do a recording but we will laugh this off and go straight on through it So many things are happening negative in this country, but you have to realize that it was founded on negative negativity in the, in the beginning. It was founded on the genocide of the indigenous people of this country, as well as the enslavement of Africans. <clears throat> so from there, all they can do is actually go up from there. It's just that we hadn't been seeing stuff on social media before. Not like now, with everybody having access to cell phones. It's just easy enough for anybody to just start recording. Whereas before, we used to at least have to have cameras and, and stuff. Because otherwise, you tell people and, and they wouldn't believe you, you know? If they wasn't there, they wouldn't believe you. So now with the advent of the mobile, cam the mobile cameras that's in every smartphone, here we go. But anyways, I'm not going to talk about anything that's been happening in the news. I'll just share things that's been happening in my life, keeping it real. I've been posting some of my family photos on Facebook. They were my pictures and some of them were my mother's pictures that I inherited from her. So some of them are before my time. <laughs> People look at those pictures and they think they're in Africa. It's like, why would they think that? I don't know. The whole area looks nothing like Africa. The automobiles in the picture wouldn't have been in Africa at the time. The way that we were dressed wouldn't have been what people would have been wearing at that time. So I don't understand the question other than people being so confused with seeing a big group of uh, black people slash African Americans slash Africans in America all together at one time that it makes them confused because all they've been seeing on social media and the news is black people, Africans in America being called minorities. <laughs> <laughs> and they've been seeing a big group of everybody else and one or two of us 
even when I used to take little classes at the college, I might be the only little kiss by the sun person in the whole class, you know? <laughs> I don't know why. It was open to anybody that wanted to pay the little $15 for the semester. But it didn't mean that I was the only uh, black person in town or whatever, like you see on those movies from Britain. I didn't even know they had that many Brits in the first place until I, I saw uh, they had an active Pan-African community there. When videotapes were out, I actually bought a videotape from a group and I was like, oh my God, they actually kept up with their African history and where they came from. I had no idea. All I could see was the Brits that sounded like the European whites over there. That's all they let us see. I had never traveled anywhere outside of the United States. But then, when I was a young woman in my 20s, I dated and married a, a, a man from Nigeria. And the first time I went to Nigeria, I was like, I don't know, so overwhelmed. I felt like inside of me something was saying, we made it, you know, we made it. I felt home. Well, when I was looking at my video, not my video, but when I was looking at my Facebook feed, one of my friends from Nigeria asked me, well, at least his, his, his last name is Nigerian, and he asked me about my elementary class picture. Why is everyone on the picture black? It's like, why would he ask such an ignorant question? You know, that's what I thought. Like, a picture is a picture. So why would anybody want to know why? You know, like it was something abnormal to see a class of black children. I thought about it for a second and I said, hmm, it must be the false history that's been going around or hasn't been going around, the lack of history that's been going around. In the first place, it's a denial of slavery ever happening. Then it's a denial that apartheid ever happened. It's a denial that before they did apartheid in South Africa, they actually studied segregation in America. <laughs> and they just reproduced it in a country where the majority was the, the indigenous people. But in this country, it happened to us. And we started off as the majority in some areas, like in the South. I have a book called The Black Majority. But after enslavement was over with, and our lives didn't matter as much because we were not property, a lot of us were systematically genocided out. We were hung home all the time, shot and every other thing. That's why they had this song called Strange Fruit Hanging from the Popular Tree. And it was about Africans in America being genocided through hanging. People would go to their churches on Sunday and talk about them going and picking somebody had a picnic after church and they would hang the person and, and take pictures and do souvenirs of the body and all kind of other crazy stuff. But anyway, not to gross anybody out on something like a fact of history, I'll go back to that picture that the guy was asking me about. Well, during segregation, which happened a little after slavery was over with, 
are supposedly over with, called over with, we are always segregated according to race. So, in Galveston, which was not any different than any other place in the United States, even if it was an island, the, at the time, we was called colored people. The colored people went to the white church and <laughs> I'm sure they was in the back of the church, but it's soon to be too many uh, colored people in the church for the whites to feel comfortable. So they figured out a way for us to have our own church so we could be separate. And so that's what they did. They, they helped set up a community for us to have the Holy Rosary Catholic Church. And it was like one of the first colored Catholic churches at the time. Now they say African American or whatever, or black church or whatever. But anyway, long story short, it was a colored church to begin with. And it was also an orphanage, which I did not know about. And I was researching this morning and found out it was also an orphanage at first. About the time I went to school there in the, in the 50s and 60s, that orphanage didn't exist anymore. It was just a school and church. So anyways, we did not interact with white people. My whole world was exactly like if I was in a little Africa of sorts. I went to school with people that looked like me. The people that taught me were Catholic nuns, the, the sisters of the Holy Family, and they were colored nuns. We had uh, priests, sometimes it was priests from Africa that were uh, colored or black or Negro or whatever they was called at the time, but they were visiting priests. <laughs> But the majority of them was Josephite fathers, and they were uh, Caucasian, and they had dedicated their lives to working with the colored people or the Negroes or whatever we was called at the time. So anyway, that was their so-called life of sacrifice. So... It was not just at Catholic schools, it was all of the schools, all of the churches. We had uh, uh, AME churches, which was African Methodist Episcopalian. They had uh, all type churches, whatever church it was. If you were not white, of course you was gonna go to the church that matched you. If you were Hispanic, then yeah, you had a Guadalupe church where people spoke Spanish and everybody looked like you and you had a school where everybody that went to the school mostly spoke Spanish and English, you know? That's, that's just how segregation worked. You was in your own communities, your own tribes, so to speak. And then uh, in the late 60s, integration happened with the, the Civil Rights Movement. Really wasn't much happening that I could see as a kid in Galveston, but I knew that I could move from the back of the bus to riding in the front of the bus when I was a little kid, and I was so excited, you know. It's like, mother, that's what I call my grandmother. Oh, I could sit behind a bus driver now. And I thought that was a good place to sit because I could see my grandmother waiting on the corner for me when I'd be going back to her house to spend the night, you know, after I visited my mother. So anyways, when I did go to Africa the first time and I got off the plane, I feel so much like, wow, this reminds me of Texas because it was so hot. And I was living in Chicago at the time, which was so cold. But when I got off the plane and I saw everybody, at least the majority of the people, look like me, 
and my family, my husband and my kids, I felt comfortable because that is how I grew up. I grew up with people that look like me all the time. Church, school, of course in my house and in my family. So how would I know anything else? And why would I need to know anything else? I was good, you know. We had 29th Street Beach and we had West Beach. So that's where we congregated. We were at peace. Wasn't no police doing anything to us. I didn't even know what a police looked like when I was growing up. I can't remember one time hearing any incident when I was a kid of anything bad happening in Galveston anyways, you know, about no police, you know, about no police doing nothing to nobody. And I heard stories from my grandmother on things black people did to other black people and not getting into trouble because they was the white man's, quote, Negro, <laughs> you know? So it was an injustice system even back then because it was long as you hurt each other, you didn't have to suffer the consequences if you worked for somebody. So it was kind of slavery <laughs> that somebody felt like you working for them made you their property. And so their property couldn't be locked up because you had a value to them and the other person had no value because they had no association with them. So if that person had any power, therefore you didn't have to suffer the consequences inside of a jail cell. But I digress a little bit. But back to that photo. We should not feel any kind of way when we share photos with each other. You should look at the photo, see if it looks old to you, and understand that that person is sharing part of their own history with you. It's very personal, and it's a way that we're sharing a timeline of our very lives with you. It's a sacred trust that we're sharing with each other. And I'm telling you, the same way that they had apartheid in South Africa, only in reverse now, because in South Africa, the majority of the people were indigenous folks. And here, at that time, uh, when they had segregation, no, we were not quite the, the minority, but after all of the genocide, yeah, we were. But we didn't know it. We didn't know it at the time because we were separated into little areas of town where we lived. So we knew that this is where the colored people lived, and we knew that there was the white folks lived over there, and we didn't think about it. And when we did integrate, I personally thought everybody I saw that didn't look like me was almost the same person. If they was the same sex, I'd be like, wow, they so friendly. That girl all day long is on, hi, hi. It took about three to six months to realize it was not the same girl. <laughs> not at all. I just could not tell them apart. They looked the same to me. Same kind of straight hair, same kind of skin tone. I didn't know. To me, they all sound the same, you know? So it just took me forever to figure out who was who. And when I go home to the motherland, I feel just like when I was growing up in America. I did not know anything about any integration or racial mixing until I was in high school. I went to elementary school and junior high with everybody look like me. And that's, that's, that's the truth. Everybody looked like me. 
So when I go back home to the motherland, it's like I'm going back in time. And I'm going back to how I grew up. My foundation, my foundation was being surrounded by everybody that looked like me. And when I did see somebody that didn't look like me, it was only at the grocery stores or maybe just a Sears Roebuck store, you know, where you go buy your clothes or whatever, you know. But it wasn't something that you did every day. And you didn't feel any kind of way because, you know, you were just going there to buy something and, and you was leaving. And that was that. So anyways, I just ask everybody, to please research our American history if you're curious about African Americans because we are a part of African and American history. So you would have to research African history. You would have to research colonization to see how colonization and slavery was so close to one another You'll have to research about apartheid and about segregation and see how they were so close together. It's, it's really, really spooky. We have so much in common before and after anything we have so much in common. Our plights are, are interrelated. We're one people and that part we have to understand. No matter what it looked like, the histories are so similar. And our mothers and fathers, mothers and fathers, and mothers and fathers, and before then, they were no such thing as slaves. <laughs> they were enslaved, which some people don't understand. They was fighting back every step of the way as much as they could, even if they had to give their children names that sound like they gave up their history and they gave up their languages. A lot of their things that they have is, is African retentions, even though they didn't know anymore why they did it. Even if they just thought it was a pretty name, they had retentions. One of my friends reminded me of my aunt's name, which is Ad Adeline, Adeline. I never thought about Ade being a root word of her name. She never had any nickname of Ade or anything like that. Nobody thought of it being any African retention name. But when he was talking about it as a Yoruba name and what it meant, I was like, wow, it's nice to know that African retentions happened and that my grandmother's name, Cora, also being an African retention even though she had no idea about it being an African instrument or a surname. So we have these retentions. Me wearing my head covered, African retention. I didn't just start doing this. This is what I did all my life. And my mother and my grandmother, my great grandmother, etc. That's just what we did. We're not copying anything from anyone. It's just that when I travel, I get the dressmakers there to help me design an outfit and then they create it for me. No different than they would have created for anybody else to request in their services. But we are who we are. Like Peter Ty say, I am that I am, I am. So anyways, I was just letting you guys know that we are alike more than we ever know we just need to research our histories and we will know and i also want to update you on what happened yesterday it was a hurricane warning and i didn't even know i was telling my friend who was asking about uh, somebody praying for him because it was a tornado warning in houston texas and then uh, he said oh you're in galveston <laughs> you, it's, a, it's a hurricane water for Texas and I just found out and everybody telling me be safe and all and all I can say is I have storm blinds on my house as you can see on that window in the back 
what's sticking out is the storm blind. So that's about as safe as you're going to get in Galveston, having storm blinds or windows that's hurricane resistant. And otherwise, if you're like me, I was brought up Catholic, I figure I have a gangster guardian angel and I'll be good. If not, wherever I go after that is what's meant to be. But anyways, once he told me the weather was coming bad in my area, I went out in the backyard and it was windy and my poor little sugar cane patch was like leaning over to the side. <laughs> so I'm like, oh my God, I've been bathing this, hair, this uh, watermelon patch. So I went and hurry up, covered it up with a little cover I had that I repurposed and I put brick down to cover it up and hopefully shield it from the wind. And when I was trying to put its little arm back under the cover, this is what happened. <laughs> so it's broken off. So all I can do is use it as compost because I don't think anything will happen with it. I mean, I could try to uh, get it to root again and put it in a hill, but I don't think anything would happen good. So. I might as well just let it become compost and fertilize my garden. And you see, as long as you plant seeds, you always have a backup. That's it. With people, as well as with fruits, vegetables, that's how the world is. As long as you keep creating seed, more people, more plants will survive, will keep living. If not this particular vine making it, these may make it. And the rest of the watermelon patch is still there after the when happened, I went back and placed it back. And it's looking good for now. Let it get some rain. And the sun is out today. You know, as you see, it's a, a nice sunny day. It has some clouds up there. But hopefully, knock on wood, as they say, no hurricane happening today. I hope not. I know bad weather happening today. I'm going to share a little bit with y'all before I end this. And I promise you, it wouldn't be long. It's med from Meditations Across the King's River by James Weeks. I've been sharing this with you guys. And it's called uh, Crossing the River. It's on chapter 16. It says, despite any doubt, you must find a way to move forward. Despite any fear, you must find a way to move forward. Despite any loss, you must find a way to move forward. So it's all working together. And I didn't even, didn't even read this before I did it. See, find a way to move forward. In all things, may you find the strength and wisdom to move forward. There is no beginning without an end. And there's no end without a beginning. So I actually think that went well with what I was talking about. It says the universe is vast and so is your potential. The only person who should be defining who you are is you. Make up your mind. Be the expansive soul you were born to be. <laughs> and with that, I'll be you. I do. <laughs> and I will say, Peace and blessings. I love all you guys. And if you have not, please subscribe by pressing the button down below. Like and share. Please comment down below. I'll read your comments and address it in one of my future videos. Please 
plant seeds of all sorts, <laughs> of all sorts. Try not to plant any people that you can't afford. <laughs> but if you can afford them, please nurture them well, and they will be there when you are no longer here, and you will go on for eternity as long as they keep planting more seed. <laughs> so anyways, power to the people, peace, blessings, and I'm out, y'all. <laughs>